So let's get going on this. I'm going to jump right to the slides. I did download them, right? Yeah, I did. And let's go through a few examples of stack memory. So we introduced this on Monday. Technically, I said everything that you need on Monday. The material was covered, uh, but it probably doesn't make sense yet, at least for most of you. So let's go through more examples and just reinforce this content that we introduced on Monday and look at some more complex examples with some more moving pieces, some more um, trickier examples, and make sure that you're ready for these. Lecture objective today, no coding. There's no pale blue dot objective. This is the time that you have to catch up on the lecture objectives and also get the programming, one of those programming objectives done and start working on the, start thinking about at least the application objective. Uh, so that's what you should be doing coding wise, just getting caught up and do the pro uh, programming objective. And more importantly, I shouldn't say more importantly, but importantly also studying for that interview and quiz tomorrow. Today's lecture especially is really going to get you ready for that quiz. Uh, since today's lecture, we're, I'm going to show you code, and I'm going to trace through the execution and show you what's happening on the stack, exactly like you're asked to do on the quiz. So your quiz is uh, exactly what we're doing in lecture today. Uh, the same exact format. Here's some code. I'm going to trace through the execution of this thing, uh, just like you have to do for your quiz. Uh, also, your interview, there will be stack questions on your interview, as well as testing questions. Uh, so be prepared for that, since those are the two new concepts that we've talked about in this um, in this learning objective. Testing, unit testing specifically, and uh, stack memory. Those are the two new things that you've learned. Scala syntax, I'm not going to test you on. Uh, it's implicitly tested during the quiz, but I'm not going to interview you. The TAs aren't going to interview you on specific Scala syntax. It's not a memorization course. We don't really do memorization in current year. Uh, all right, so let's get into it. So I have this very beautiful subtract method, which I claim takes two integers and returns the difference between them, x minus y. So if I have five and three, and I have five minus three, this should print out two. I'll, I'll assure you that it does. This example is in the repo. I pushed the repo probably half an hour before class, if you pull the new examples. Uh, this is in a file named uh, variable scope example, I believe it is. And I also have testing. There's another new test suite where I test all of the methods in that class. You can look at my subtract test methods, uh, test cases. You can decide for yourself if my test cases are comprehensive or not, if they're, uh, if they're good enough for you to be convinced that this method is correct. But uh, if not, I'm just going to tell you this method is correct. It will correctly subtract x minus y. It's very convoluted. Obviously, this is not how you would do it. You would just say x minus y right here. Uh, but I wrote this very convoluted subtract method so we can talk about variable scoping. Uh, we talked about this on Monday, but I believe I forgot to call it by name at all because I had students asking me, looking at the syllabus, saying you're going to test us on variable scoping during the interview, but I don't even know what that is yet. Uh, we did talk about it, I just didn't call it by name, so I'm going to make sure I call it by name today. Uh, variable scoping. So in this method, we have multiple variables named x. We have quite a few of them. Multiple variables named y, actually, do we? Just two. And one variable named z. And we want to keep track of in one variable named x. Uh, but specifically the x, that's the big one. We have a lot of variables named x. This is legal code. This compiles, this runs, everything's fine with it. But when we say x, which value of x is being used when there are so many of them being created? That's what we want to talk about today. And the answer is variable scoping is going to determine which one is used. So let's jump right into this. We, we saw an example like this where I was tracing through uh, a program and then showing what's happening on the stack. So let's dive into it. Um, we, we're jumping right in the middle of this execution. The main method is running. We have a stack frame for the main method. The command line arguments go on the stack in this main stack frame. And the stack is where we're storing the variables in our code. All the variables are stored in the stack. So when we create a variable or values in this case, I'll probably just say variable start lecture. 
uh, to keep it keep just one term out there but a variable x and y with values 5 and 3 so when we say val x of type int equals 5 we're declaring a variable naming it x giving it type int i could put the, the type here as well and assigning it the value 5 so that goes on the stack and the stack remembers that variable name so whenever we use a variable x like in this line this x to resolve this x to decide what this resolves to which value we mean when we say x we're going to look at the stack or the computer is going to look at the stack and look for a variable named x and look up its value it doesn't look at your code this code was already processed it's already done with that code it's just going to look at the stack which is where it's storing that the results of that code after it's processed after these lines are executed we look at the stack to see what the current value is for a specific variable so x and y go on the stack they're inside the main stack frame the stack frame for the main method and uh and then we can look up these variable values at any time. Uh, it scans from bottom bottom to top, correct? And and we'll get when we get to this line right here, we're going to start running through those scans. First, we just got to get some stuff on the stack for uh, before we get to that. So now we're going to call subtract. We want to eventually create a variable named z. Add that to the stack and assign it the value that resolves here. But we have to resolve the right side of the equal sign first. We have to resolve this down to a value, and then we'll create z and put it on the stack and assign it that value. So whenever we call a method, we're going to create a new stack frame. So when subtract is called, we're creating a new stack frame for the subtract method. This stack frame acts like a completely isolated environment apart from the rest of the program. So in the rest of the program, we have other variables on the stack and other things going on. And there's more information here that I, I'm excluding. Uh, for example, the program pointer, which remembers when we return to the main stack, that we have to return to right here this line of code. So this stack is remembering, hey, I, I've created this stack, I put that, uh, this frame, I put that on the stack. But whenever I get control back, whenever this frame ends, I'm going to pick up execution right here. That's where I was. So that information is encoded in here as well. So we put a new frame on the stack, a completely isolated environment. So, and we assign the values of the arguments, which resolve to five and three, because those were resolved before the stack frame is created, and then assign those to the parameters x and y. So we create variables x and y, assign them the values of the arguments, and put those on the stack inside the subtract, the stack frame for the subtract method call. So we have two frames on the stack, and this subtract stack frame, this is the currently executing stack frame. This is the frame that currently has control over the program. So let's start stepping through this subtract method call. First line we hit is creating a variable named z and assigning it the value of x. So we had the first time that we have to resolve a variable. We have the value x. So we're going to start at the current block of execution, which is the subtract start uh, stack frame. This happens before the loop block is created. So we add a variable z, assign it the value x, which we look up here. x is 5. Uh, technically, this x is also 5. So no matter which one we found, it would be 5. But we can't go past this stack frame. We can't go past the start of the stack frame. So we can't even access this x anyway. So this x is not in scope at all. We can't, uh, what we call in scope, we can't see that variable x from inside this stack frame. We can't see this y, we can't see this these args. Inside the stack frame, we don't have access to any of these variables. We can't access them because they're in a different stack frame. We cannot access them. 
So since we do find an x inside this stack frame, we're going to find this value 5 and assign that 5 to the variable x. If there was not a variable x inside the subtract stack frame, we would get a, uh, a variable not found error. It would say, I don't know what x is, because you can never, ever, I shouldn't say never, ever, because I'm sure there's some really weird, crazy case, but you can't look outside of the stack frame for a variable. Uh, how do global variables work? Scala doesn't have global variables, so we ain't going to think about it. Uh, uh, how they work in different languages is going to be up to that language, how they handle them. So we can't ex escape our stack frame. So we can't see these variables. So if this were named, um, if this were named input instead of x, Right here, we would get a variable not found, can't resolve x to a value, and it would be a compiler error, nothing would even run, because we can't escape this stack frame and see this variable x. Can't see it. And, and one reason, uh, uh, there are plenty of reasons why not to do that, but say, uh, say we named this something else, and we were relying on this x being this x, from outside the stack frame well what happens when this is named something else or what happens when we're calling the subtract method from another method that doesn't have an x in scope now subtract is going to break depending on who's calling it which is not the type of dependency that we want uh, we don't don't want that at all so we got the we got the value because we passed it as an argument so we took this x, resolved it to 5, because it's on the stack inside the mainframe. The, the method call itself, when we're resolving the arguments, happens inside the main stack frame. And then when the stack frame is created, we create this x and this y. That's what's going on the stack here. And assigning it to whatever these values resolve to. They happen to be x and y, because I'm reusing variable names a lot here, uh, so we can talk about variable scoping. But these resolved to three and uh, five and three. That five and three got assigned to these this x and y when they were created, and then we saw this five here. So x resolved to five because there is a variable named x inside this stack frame with the value five. Then we get to our loop. We create a new block of code. Whenever we create a new block, that's a another separate. Um, part of execution, piece of execution. It's not as strict as a stack frame, but it will control the scoping of our variables. And specifically inside a loop block, we can start use, reusing variable names. This variable i is going to be created in, in this loop block. Even if we had a variable i out here, it's not going to be a name conflict. So for example, if I said var z of type n equals x, and then on the next line said var z of type n equals three, that's going to give me an error because I already have a value z in that scope, in that code block. Once I start a new code block, that's separated from the code block that we were in, and we can start, uh, those variables declared in that block are going to be separated from the other variables. However, we can still see and access these variables. So it's not like a stack frame, but it still does separate the variables on the stack. So we start the loop block and we create a variable named i, assign it the value zero, the first value in the data structure that we're iterating over, and that goes inside the loop block. We create a value named x, and assign it a variable x and assign it the value 20. And then we execute this, uh, I forgot that I had a method call here. Uh, we check the conditional is negative of y. Is negative is actually another method which will create a new stack frame and then go through its execution. We're gonna, and then that stack frame is destroyed when it returns. We're gonna skip over the that stack frame and and uh, get the return value of this is negative of y. 
y is not negative, so this will be false, and we'll go into the else block. When we go into the else block, we're going to create and mark our start of our new block. This block creates a variable x and assigns it the value 1. And that x is created inside of this block, the else block, which blocks, it, recall, whenever you see an open and close brace, that's a block. So we have a block of code here. This x is declared inside this block. So I'm annotating that in my stack by saying this is the start of the else block. And this variable x with value 1 is inside of that else block. And this is the line that we got to talk about for quite a while. So this line, z minus equals x, or z equals z minus x, if we use the, the longer hand expression, regardless, we have to compute z minus x. So we have to ask ourselves, what is z going to resolve to? And what is x going to resolve to? What are we actually subtracting here? Because we have four different variables named x, on the stack we only have one variable named z but it's not in the current block so how are we going to get the right values out of this or rather what values is Scala going to grab for each of these variables this is what we want to think about for a while let me catch up on chat a little bit let's think about that for a second and any questions on anything that I just went through uh, and of course for the quiz tomorrow you're expected to be able to trace through and get the stack like you should be able to draw this stack. If this were the highlighted line on your quiz, you should be able to give me this in that third part of the question. You should be able to write this. And it's fine to write it in the Google form. You can do new lines and use the same syntax is preferred because I'll know exactly what you're talking about. Where is the is negative method? I, it's in this file. I didn't put it on the slide. But it's in the same file. If you go to the repo, you can get the is negative method. It's a similarly convoluted method that checks if a var variable of a value is negative or not an in integer. What is variable scoping? So variable scoping is this question right here, effectively. This question is all about variable scoping. Uh, when we have a variable, when we're saying, give me the value of x. Variable scoping is asking, okay, where, what x should we grab? Uh, and we go to the stack to see that. And if we can access an x, whatever x we access, we say that that is the x that's currently in scope. And we'll see that we'll access this x right here. So this x is in scope. This x is not in scope. This x is not in scope. This x is not in scope. This is the current value of x that's in scope. It's just uh, the terminology that we use. Z, we're going to see that this is the variable named z that's in scope. There's only one variable named z, so this one's easier. But this is the variable that's in scope. Even though it's not in the current block, or even the block above that, it's still in scope because we can access it. And we call this, our, our big umbrella term for this is variable scoping. Yeah, so, and we never we never created anything for this on the stack, the if, because this was false. So we skip over this, go right to the else, and then we enter this block, and that's where we start putting things on the stack. Nothing got put on the stack during this because it was completely skipped. That whole block of code was skipped because the condition was false. Oh, that got answered like four times. Make it five with mine. Do all the if else's count as one block or do they get their own? Uh, only one of them is going to be executed. So no matter what the answer to that question is, it's going to have the same effect on our code. Since only one of these can ever be executed and we, we're not declaring variables inside the conditional, like we do for a loop, we declare a variable here. We don't do that for conditionals. 
This is a Boolean expression. It resolves to a Boolean. We use that Boolean to decide where control is going to flow to, and then we throw away that Boolean. It's never stored on the stack. Should we not write deleted blocks on our quiz? No, you should. So you should, but you shouldn't. So I'm going to ask, trace through the execution of this program, just like the, the sample question on the uh, last week's lab. I'm going to say, trace through the execution of this program. When you trace through it, you should say a stack frame is created here, a stack frame is deleted there. So you should talk about the, the ones that are deleted at that point. For the part C, the third part, uh, when I say, here's a highlighted line, tell me the state of the stack at that point. For that question, you shouldn't mention the frames that were deleted. Just show me the frames that are currently on the stack at that line. But you still need to explain about the ones that are created and destroyed in the other part of the question. The if stack frame, is that considered deleted? So conditionals don't put a stack frame. It's a new code block. Uh, in this one, that block was never created since the condition was false. This whole block is skipped, and this block is executed. So it was never put on. It was never put on the stack at all. All right. So let's resolve these two variables, z and x. This is the the crux of what we want to talk about in this example. This is what we'll spend um, most of the rest of the time on on this example. So let's resolve these variables first. Let's resolve x. So we were looking for a variable named x. We're going to start looking in the currently executing block. That's always where we start our search. What's deleted then? Nothing's been deleted yet. In this example, we haven't removed anything from the stack. I don't know why, why people are asking about that. Um, none's been deleted in this example yet. We will delete stuff, but none's been deleted yet. So we start looking in the currently executing block. The block at the bottom of the stack visually or the top of the stack for the, the abstract type, uh, data structure, a stack data structure, what's pushed on the top. That's where we start. So we're going to start at the bottom of this visually or the highest memory address. You can think of it that way. Um, we're going to start in this block and look for a variable named X. Huzzah, we found one. Use it. It resolves to one. So our X resolves to one. This X is going to resolve to one because we found an X inside the current block that um, that we can use. Right, so you'll during the quiz, you'll randomly get pulled into a breakout room for 10 minutes for your interview, and then you'll get put back in the, then you'll go back to the main session and keep working on your quiz. It's exactly how it's going to go. Uh, so X is going to result to one. We found X in the current block. Done. So this X never got searched and never even got considered. This X never got considered, never got looked at at all. And this X we can't even access at all, no matter what, under any conditions, because it's outside of the current stack frame. This is a, a hard line. You can think of these as soft lines. We're going to start looking here. If we don't find something, we're going to start looking here. If we don't find something, we're going to start looking here. But once we hit a stack frame, the start of a stack frame, that's a hard line. You cannot look beyond that. That's completely, that's out of scope regardless of any conditions. These two variables are always, three variables, are always out of scope no matter what else, no matter what, because it's in a different stack frame. So X resolves to one. Let's resolve Z. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to start looking in the current block. This is where we start our search, and we don't find a variable named Z. No variable named Z. We're out of luck. So we're going to expand our search to the next block. We're going to look in the loop block and check for a variable named Z. No luck here either. We didn't find any. If there were a Z in this block, if right here we name this value Z, then that would be the one that's found, and that would be the one, the Z in scope. And that's the one that would be used. We don't find one. We didn't do that. So we're out of luck here as well. So we expand our search again. Excuse me. Expand our search again. We go to the next block, which happens to be a method block, which means we created a new stack frame for that. So we search in the stack frame itself for a Z. 
we do find one, and it has value 5. So z is going to resolve to 5. Because that is the, the, the closest z on the stack to the current execution of the program. We're currently executing here, so we're just going to search. We're going to search this block, then this block, then this block. That's how we're, we're going to search. We're going to keep expanding our search for z. And each block can have duplicate variable names. We have an x in this block. We have an x in this block. We have an x in this block. And that's perfectly fine. That's allowed because on the stack, those are going to be separated. The code's going to be separated into blocks. What if you refuse to join the breakout room? Yeah, you just fail. It's... Uh, what what else would happen, bad boy? Like, uh, so are there any questions about this? About how to resolve X and Z? That makes sense, at least. Makes sense following a lecture. Are you confident enough that you can do that in the lab tomorrow? That's the trickier part. What is minus equal? This is shorthand. This is equivalent of z equals z minus x. Yes, sir. I like it. I like the confidence. Yeah, like Arafat says, exactly that. If my Wi-Fi lost connection during the interview, then I work with you and we reschedule something. Uh, at the very least, everybody has a minimum of three chances anyway. If you lose Wi-Fi three times, I'm going to start getting suspicious that uh, about that. But even then, you know, we can talk about it. And if it's a legit issue, we'll just reschedule another three times. It's not that big of a deal. This example isn't over. The, the example's not over, but the rest is just destroying stuff and freeing up memory. I'm not going to go through every every little piece of this. Uh, so the rest of this, dog ate my computer. Like when people, when students email me that their internet connection is out, well, how'd you email me? Uh, sometimes there's a legitimate, legitimate answer to that question. Um, somewhat surprisingly. But uh, but the, they'll usually say it's on their phone, but you can... I mean, you can zoom on your phone. You just download the app. Uh, if you're alive in 2021, you should be able to, to do that. Maybe uh, the legitimate answers are they just barely have enough internet, and they can just barely get that email off, but they don't have enough bandwidth to, uh, to support Zoom. It happens. You know, I just reschedule with those students. It's not that big of a deal. We get, we get through everything. Um, so... We resolved Z, we resolved X, we found the Z and X that are currently in scope, and we can assign Z, uh, again, Z to get the assignment. We look, do our same thing, no Z, no Z. We do find a Z, so Z equals four after we compute the subtraction. So Z is gonna be updated to four because we assign Z to the, uh, to the evaluation of Z minus X. Z equals four. We get to the end of the else block. Whenever we get to the end of a block, we destroy everything that was created in that block. So we started the block, we created a, a variable named x. When we get to the end of that block, everything's destroyed until we get to the start of the else block, our marker for that. All that's destroyed, so that x is gone, and this x with the value 20 is now the x that's in scope again. So if we type x right here, right after the if, right after this else block ends, x is going to resolve to 20 because that's the x that's in scope. We keep looping. Uh, I won't go through all the looping, but we keep looping until the loop's over. By the end, z is going to have the value 2. We get to the end of the loop block, so everything that was created inside that loop block, which is i and x, those are destroyed until we get to the start of the loop block. 
All that's destroyed, removed from the stack, popped off the stack. That's gone. And we get to our return value Z. We're going to look for Z. It's in the currently executing block, so we don't have to search very far for it. Z has the value 2, so we're going to return that. And likewise, just with our blocks ending, we have the block of the method ending, which means we're returning whatever the last thing that was evaluated was. We get to the end of that, which means we're about to destroy a stack frame. So this X, Y, Z, all that's got to go. We're going to pop all that off the stack and get back to this stack frame in this execution. This stack frame, remember that this is where it was waiting. It was waiting for subtract to resolve. Subtract resolve to 2. So now we have Z equals 2. Create a variable named Z. Add it to the stack. Give it the value, assign it the value two, and then we print z, uh, print two to the screen. This whole this whole program could be simplified as print line two, but you know <laughs> that's uh, uh, not an exciting example. But uh, showing variable scope is what we want to do, and then we print two to the screen. We get to the end of the main method block, destroy that frame. That's the end of our program. Program over. Uh, that process is destroyed and then uh, there's no memory left of our program and we can rerun it if we want to see it run again uh, but that program is over the stack's gone that goes back to the operating system and uh, in program ends program over so any other questions about this example oh man that that took longer than I, I thought it would I might go quicker through the next example isn't it four? No. Oh, maybe. I see where you, I see where you could say that. No, it, it is going to be... So I skipped the loop. So Z is four here, but I skipped the rest of the loop. The loop's going to keep iterating here. Uh, here. This is going to keep iterating. Uh, and then Z is going to be two after that loop ends. We set Z to four. I skipped setting Z to three and then setting Z to two. I skipped the, that step, those steps. Because it's exactly the same as we went through the first time. Uh, just going through it two more times. Can we please go over the last three minutes again? Uh, with the, the last three minutes with the stuff being destroyed off the stack. Each time we hit a closing brace, we're going to destroy stuff. Is the, the short line of that. We hit this closing brace. Destroyed the if statement. Uh, the else block. We hit this closing brace, we destroyed the loop block. We hit this closing brace, we destroyed the stack frame. We hit this closing brace, we destroyed that stack frame. So anytime you hit a closing brace, you're destroying stuff on the stack. Everything you put on the stack since the previous open brace is what you're going to destroy, is the, the uh, concise way of saying it. Yeah, the loop. And feel free to go through that example. Open it in the the uh, IntelliJ, pull the repo, get that example, and play around with it. Yeah, there's definitely a loop in there. Uh, it does actually compute the subtraction. I have my unit tests. You can verify it. How do you show deleted sex? Why do I keep getting this? Three times I'm getting that same question. I did answer that. Um, it, it's so when I say so, if I gave the highlighted line when I say show the state of the stack at this highlighted line, if my highlighted line is right here, the last line of main or the first line of main, something silly like that, uh, there won't be much to show. You don't have to show the deleted frames. You don't have to show anything that's been deleted. What, and on the question where I say, give me the state of the stack at this highlighted line. For the question where I say, trace through the execution of this program, for that one, you should say, okay, then a new stack frame is created. Okay, and then this stack frame is destroyed. And then there's a new block here. Uh, you should be explaining all that when you go through the trace of the program. Yeah, I do know how to subtract and use a loop. Uh, so let's look at another example. This one is actually going to be a recursive example. Don't panic. I don't expect you to un to be able to write recursive programs at this point in the course. That'll be much later, uh, and we'll talk about it in depth. 
but I do expect you to be able to read through this. Given your new knowledge about the stack and stack frames, you should be able to read through this recursive example. So with that in mind, let's do exactly that and run through this example of a method that calls itself, which we call recursion, this is a recursive method. So we're gonna start the main frame and I'm gonna cut out some of the, the, uh, the text on the top here. But we have the arguments, the command line arguments. We're going to call compute geometric sum, which creates a new stack frame. We're calling it with the value 3. So we assign its parameter n to the argument 3 and put that on the stack inside of this method call. Our first, uh, our first line is a conditional, if n greater than 3. So what's n? n is 3. So we're going to enter the if block we're going to mark that on our stack the if block started and the first thing we do is call compute geometric sum again with n minus one so when we hit this if block we're going to look for n this is the n that's currently in scope three three minus one gives us two compute geometric sum of two a method call with the argument two is going to create a new stack frame on the stack this method call creates a new stack frame. And with this, in this stack frame for this call of compute geometric sum, we're going to have the parameter n equal to two. This call is gonna do the same thing. We start over again at the beginning of the method for this stack frame. While this stack frame is waiting on this line, it's gonna sit there and wait until this stack frame returns. And then we're going to, uh, and then we're going to pick up execution once this stack frame finally returns, which will be in quite a while. So this stack frame is going to do the same thing. It hits the conditional. Two is greater than zero. We start the new if block. We get to this line, compute geometric sum of n minus two. n, in this case, the n in scope is going to be two. Let me keep it on this slide. The n is going to be two. So we compute one and compute geometric sum of one. We have another new method call. We're going to put a new frame on the stack. We're going to create another variable of the name of the parameter and assign it the argument. So we put a new frame on the stack. This time n is 1. And we're going to do the same thing. n, 1, still greater than 0. We use this n because it's the only n inside the stack frame. We can't see these other n's no matter what. They're in different stack frames. They're completely separate portions of execution. We cannot see them. We cannot go past this. This is a hard wall. We cannot go past. So we do have n equals 1. So n, 1 minus 1, compute geometric sum of 0. Put a new frame on the stack. That conditional, this, this time, 0 greater than 0. Oh, sorry, that if block is here. Uh, we put a new frame on the stack with n equals 0, and you can see we got frame, a frame, a frame, a frame, and the main frame up here. So we have a lot of frames on this stack, all with different values of n. But the value of n, whenever we ask ourselves what's the actual value of n that's in scope right now, it's the one that's in the current stack frame. And we could have multiple values of n, we could create another n inside these blocks. Uh, like we did on the last example. Uh, but this, uh, in this stack frame, n is 0, so that's the n we're going to use. We hit our conditional. 0 greater than 0 is going to be false now. So we're going to go to the else, put that block on the stack, which all this does is return 0. This is the last line. We hit the end of the block, the end of the stack frame. So we're going to return the last thing that was evaluated, which is 0. So this stack frame gets to its return value. We're going to return 0. And we're going to return that value back to the previous stack frame. So we give, we hand off execution back to this stack frame. And we hand it the value 0. This stack frame is going to remember that it was waiting for this call to resolve. This call resolved to 0. So we get this value 0. Create a variable named result to store that zero. 
and assign it that return value from the other stack frame. This method is going to compute result plus n. Oh, let me go back one. Result is 0. We find it in the if block. n, we don't find it in the if block, so we expand our search. We find it right here. n is 1. So result is going to equal 0 plus 1. Result equals 1. And then we're going to return result. This We hit the end of this block, the end of this block, the end of the stack frame. The last thing that was evaluated was result, which resolved to 1. So now we return 1 back to this stack frame. This stack frame says, oh, good, I got 1. This I was sitting here waiting on this. I got that resolved. That stack frame returned 1 to me. I can assign that to result. I can compute result plus n. Result, we find it in this block, so this result is in scope. N, we don't find it here, but we do find it in the frame outside of this block. N is 2, and we're going to end up returning 3 from this stack frame. So we compute 3. We return 3. This stack frame gets execution back. It got 3. Result equals 3. Result plus equals N. Result is 3. N is 3. So we're going to return 6 back to the main frame. We return 6 over here. Result equals 6. Main frame gets execution back. Print 6 to the screen. Then our program's over. Our program just prints 6. Nothing exciting. So even recursion can be very mysterious, but at this point you should be able to read through recursion. I will give you a, I'll give you a heads up. I don't have a recursive question on tomorrow's quiz, uh, just so you know. I might put one on the the second chance quiz because you have more time to digest this material. Uh, but there's none tomorrow, so don't panic uh, about recursion if you're tempted to. But you should be able to read through this. This puts a call on the stack. Uh, this puts a frame on the stack. This puts a frame on the stack. You keep putting frames on the stack until you hit. Uh, a case that doesn't put a new frame on the stack, something we call the base case in recursion. Then we start returning and then start picking up execution for each stack. And each stack remembers exactly where it was when it created that next stack. Yeah, uh, learning objective three, we learn it by recursion. Uh, that's when you're going to be expected to write recursive methods, uh, which is uh, another leap uh, of, uh, of stuff. Reading them, I don't think is too hard if you draw out the stack. Uh, writing recursive methods gets pretty tough. Uh, not to scare you, it's not too tough, but it, it's uh, another way of thinking. Then we free up all the memory of our program, no memory of our program. So that worked cool uh, with a recursive method like that. Uh, but what if we change that code slightly? All I did here was remove the conditional instead of saying if n less than 0. And I just always do this, what we call the recursive step. Well, now every time we call this method, it's going to call itself unconditionally forever. So with this, and by the way, with the, the previous example, I forgot I wanted to mention this. We got pretty close to the end of the stack here. That's just the way that I put this on the slide. Your actual stack space is going to be significantly larger than this. It'll be large enough that you'll never have to worry about running out of stack space. But in this example, we got pretty close to the end of the stack and to using memory that might be used by another program. Just visually, you, you won't, you know, unless you do something like we're about to see, you won't actually run into that. So what if this is our code and we go to that spot where we were at the bottom of our recursion, this is where we hit our base case, we return zero. What if we didn't and we just put another call to geometric sum, another frame, on the stack with negative one, negative two. We can keep adding these and eventually we're going to get to a point where we're adding a stack to the frame that's going to require memory that's used by another program. And this is where we get our dreaded stack overflow error, the namesake of one of our favorite sites. We get a stack overflow, the program crashes. It says, hey, you're trying to use too much memory. You can't do that. I'm shutting you down. Program crashes, execution over. Um, you'll only see this if you do something like this, where we have what we call infinite recursion. You're trying to put infinite 
stacks on the frame, you're eventually going to run out of space. If you're not going infinite, it's really hard to run out of stack, stack space. All right, and I want to, with four minutes, I want to spend a lot of time on that first example. And I did exactly that. Uh, where's my IntelliJ? Uh, so I'm going to pull. Pull. Did I really not push? Oh, god damn it. And I was saying that during lecture. It's like. I was like, just pull the repo, you'll get the latest code. And here I don't even have it. <laughs> Didn't even push. On my laptop, there was a dialog box that was saying, are you sure? Yeah, I'm fucking sure. Sorry for the, for, sorry for cursing there. I'm sure, I'm sure I want to push. Oh, goodness. Uh, so, uh, so here's all the code. You can look through the, the other ones. Here's the is negative method that, that we referenced. <laughs> uh, so, and here's the subtract method. Uh, and the one that I want to show is going to be that last example that we saw. Oh, and, and just to so I can flash it on screen here. Uh, here's all my testing for it. Here's my testing for the subtract method. All these test cases pass. We can run this. Uh, let's run the whole thing. <laughs> Mike, edit that out. Yeah, Mike, if you could edit that out. <laughs> uh, the this these tests will pass. Uh, so if my subtract method passes all these tests, are you convinced that it's correct? I'd say you should be pretty convinced, but that's up to you. Maybe you want more testing. Uh, if you want more testing, you can add more testing and, and see if that subtract method is doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, but I say that it is. I think it is. Uh, maybe you can find some edge case where, where it's wrong. But let's... Go into, let's go into this method. There we go. And I want to show you what we call the debugger. This is something that your TAs should be talking about quite a bit in office hours, especially when you have those really tricky to debug questions, is uh, setting a breakpoint and using the debugger. You guys are going to get me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to set a breakpoint at a spot where we, we want to check for our errors. I'm going to set a breakpoint right here so I can see a lot of good information that you'll see in a second. And then when we run this program, instead of, oh, shit, you, shoot, you can't see the, you can't see the drop downs. Uh, I'm just going to run this first. But in that drop down, there are several, several different options. I'm just going to run it so I can use these buttons up here just to show you. This will run the previous code that ran. I click this. I'm going to run it again. If I click this button right next to it, this bug button, this is going to run the debugger on my code. So now I click this. It's going to run the debugger, which what this is going to do is run my code until it hits one of my breakpoints. And when it does hit a breakpoint, it's going to pause execution and show me what's going on in this program. Specifically, it's going to give me the state of all the variables that are currently in scope, and it's going to show me the stack frames that are on the stack. So by the time we hit this zero, this was the peak of our, uh, of our execution, the most stuff that we had on the stack. N is going to be zero at this point. And we can see the stack over here, if we look at the stack frames, this is the current stack frame running on line 13 of the compute geometric sum method. If we go down one, and visually this is upside down from the slides, if we go down one, we're going to get to the stack frame that created that stack frame, the call to compute geometric sum that called compute geometric sum of zero. In this stack frame, n was one. If we go up one more, this stack frame that called that one 
n was 2, the stack frame with n equals 3, and all these stack frames are sitting on this line 9 waiting for this return value of compute geometric sum. And we go to the next one, we can get to main. Main is sitting on line 18, waiting for that top level call of compute geometric sum. And we can see the command line arguments. It's just an empty array because we're not using command line arguments. And we get to see all of this information in the, um, in the debugger. Uh, and then a very valuable button right here, step in two, is going to step one line of execution and we can step through our programs and we can see exactly what's happening as our program runs. So we uh, we destroyed a few stack frames there. We're on this stack frame where n equals two, result equals one. I can step through, result plus equals n, result is three now. This is going to end. Sometimes the highlighted line gets a little off. That stack frame ends, returns three, three, uh, n is 3, result, it gets assigned the return value, gets created and assigned the return value. Result is returned, which is going to be 6 after adding 3 plus 3. That's returned to the main method. This should be over here. I don't know why it always highlights the wrong line. And compute geometric sum of 3 returns 6. Result is 6. Print it to the screen. And we can click over to the console to see what was printed as well like we normally would. Then back to the debugger. Program's over. Uh, go us. Now we do this again. I'm going to move my breakpoint to right here. Do this again with our stack overflow error. Now we're going to hit this breakpoint. N is 3. N is 2 with a new stack frame. N is 1 with a new stack frame. N is 0 with a new stack frame. We don't hit a base case. N is negative 1 calls compute geometric sum of negative 2, calls compute geometric sum of negative 3, so on and so forth. We're just going to keep putting frames on the stack with different values of n. And we're going to keep doing this until our program crashes. When you're running the debugger, if you want to continue execution, you can run this button. It's going to run your program until it hits another breakpoint, which is going to be on the next line. If I remove this breakpoint and continue execution, now we're going to run until we crash. Sometimes it takes a while. Run in the debugger, there's a lot of overhead. So sometimes it takes a while. I don't feel like waiting, so I'm just going to run it normally. So we run it. And we get our stack overflow error exception, stack overflow error. And it's going to give us the stack trace, which shows us what where each stack frame was. We can see we got a stack frame on line 9, a stack frame on line 9, a stack frame on line 9. And we have a lot of them. So you have a lot of stack space, space to work with. If, you're, if you have this many frames on the stack, and you're not going infinite with something, uh, you really need to rethink how you're coding. Uh, this is a lot of frames. You don't have to really worry about how uh, overflowing the stack unless you go infinite, typically with recursion. You're going to see stack overflow errors when you start writing recursive methods. Uh, but without having an error like that, you're not going to overflow the stack. I made the mistake of presenting these this lecture without mentioning that a bunch of times. And they're like, man, there's you can only have like four calls on the stack holy crap we're gonna stack overflow all the time but uh that's not the case you can do a, a lot and actually just really quick i know i'm a little over but i i want to do this really quick just to show you how many frames are on the stack let's print n and see how negative we go how low we go no oh, it's not over nine thousand but it's almost nine thousand uh, frames that we got on the stack there.